none of us possesses anything. Possession is an illusion. Things just keep rolling in this universe. They keep rolling into our hands and out just as we need them and just as we need to let them go. If we grasp them, that's when we suffer. If we just let them slide through our hands. Then it's like you're surfing through the universe. It's like a, a liberation. I've been living moneyless for over five years now. When I first started doing this, I, I called it an experiment, but the more I do it, the more and more it seems like a way of life and not just something that I'm trying for a while. Well, I used to live in Boulder, Colorado. I was in severe depression when I lived there and sick of the rat race. And, and I had a friend that had moved to Moab and Moab is the kind of place where there's very little judgmentalism. It's small enough that I walk down the street and always recognize somebody. And there's things to forage here. <laughs> I thought, well, I'll just quit my job in Boulder and come here. That's when I really started whittling down possessions and money, started living more and more simply. Whatever comes along at random, that's where I stay. <laughs> I have a cave up the canyon, but I stand up, got a stash of food up there. And then I house it a lot in Moab. Like, it's kind of a word of mouth thing. People ask me to house it. And then friends tell friends. Last winter, I, I spent most of the winter indoors in houses. Before I started living this way, I was working with the homeless. And the idea of being homeless terrified me. And especially in the city, in the shelter situation, it's such a demeaning thing. It's just like an, an industry where you herd people in and herd them out. And then I started thinking about it. Well, what is it about homelessness? What is it that causes me to be so anxious about this? It's not the physical aspect of it. I like to go camping, I like to rough it, I like challenges. The big hardship about it would be worrying about what people think and the stigma in it. I continually have to keep my focus like it's a day by day thing because sometimes I'll fall into the anxiety of worrying about what's going to happen in the future or society's images of what a person should be. I go through these phases of doubt, these phases where, wow, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> but when I'm up in the canyon for long periods of time, all my doubt vanishes. Nature provides everything exactly as we need it in the moment. And even, even hardship and death and pain, if we accept that as nature doles it out to us in the moment, we evolve and that's natural selection. We sidestep natural selection. We don't have faith that nature takes care of the balance. Faith is living in the moment without worry for the future and holding on to things in the past. 
and not thinking about credit and debt and, and what's going to happen tomorrow if I don't have this and if I don't control this or that. How did money enter into this whole scene of nature, into this Eden? So what is money? It's an attempt to control credit and debt. Trade is not a bad thing, but it's like control of trade is what got us into the mess we're in. If it looks good, then continue with it. But if it doesn't, we should experiment with trying to live without that control of credit and debt. So how does trade enter into this picture? Well, I, I go and I pee and poop in random places, and that's what I give back to the earth. But it's the fact that I'm not even conscious of myself giving, that it's just so natural that it's like it's so egoless to go and shit in the woods, that that's why it's the, it's the most holy act I could do, because I'm not aware of it. It's like I don't think, well, okay, I took a raspberry from this bush, so now I have to piss on it and give it back. And all of nature is working on this egoless level of giving and taking without really even being conscious of it. That's why it has balance. When I was about 27, I went into the Peace Corps, spent two years in the Andes and Ecuador, and then came back to the States, and I had kind of a reverse culture shock. The rampant materialism was kind of disconcerting. Then I went to Alaska, it was like a couple years before India. I wanted to try my hand at hitching back to Moab, Utah from Alaska, and to see if I could do it, and I left Alaska with $50 in my pocket. and. When I got back to Moab, I counted my money and I had $25. And I thought, wow. And then I thought of all the things I spent money on and it was like things that I didn't need, like candy and uh, a beer, whatever, you know, stuff that I didn't need. It amazed me and, I, and that was the first time I thought, it's totally possible to live without money. reach the state of faith when I'm up here in the canyon, but how can it be strong enough to bring it in to civilization? So I have to keep going back and forth to finally reach a state where I can maintain that, that level of confidence within civilization and without. Let's see, a day in my life. Um, when I'm around town, I, I get up and walk around town and chat with folks that I meet along the way and, and uh, check email and I get food from dumpsters sometimes and sometimes people give me food. People don't realize how fresh food is thrown away like most every day. A lot of times things are thrown away, they're not even expired yet. I kind of emulate the raven or something scavenger of society. I've never asked for food, but so far out of five years I haven't gone a day hungry. You know, I've gone half a day hungry, you know, and then, then I'll get food. What bad lead. This is my friend Penny's backyard treehouse. And one day she said, yeah, you can crash there anytime you want. 
and I don't stay here that often. It's just when I want to do stuff in town and I don't want to go up the canyon at night and I crash here. And it's a good drop-off point for stuff. And it's a mulberry tree. And it kind of feels like a mother because it's I rest in her arms and and I eat fruit from her branches. <laughs> I uh, recently started a blog, which I write a few things in occasionally. Part of me just feels this urge to communicate to the world these things, you know, it's things that I'm learning. The more I do this, the more absurd the whole system seems, the more I, it seems absurd going back to it, you know, back to the whole nine to five thing. Because to me, that's what, that, that's, where I see the real suffering. You know, I can see it on people's faces. It's like being enslaved. It's strange when, when people like that sometimes will feel sorry for me. Sometimes I'll throw it back at them and I'll say, well, do you really think that I'm suffering more than you are? or if, that I'm suffering at all. They're the ones that are popping the antidepressants to get through the day so that they can be the cog in the machinery. The root of mental illness is, is our attachments and our ego. And what society does, instead of getting to the root of the problem, they give you numbing things like antidepressants and alcohol or television or retreats or whatever. Wealth is an addiction and it's hiding big wounds that are inside of people. I do this the more the more comfortable the whole world seems to me this whole universe is my home everywhere I go it's home it's like home isn't someplace else but it's right here no matter where I go and everything I need comes when I need it. Thank you.